Um, I guess I got a feeling with thought, right? Okay. I'd like to start the meeting then because we want to start ourselves plenty of time. Yep. Um, the meeting's begun. Uh, we would like to uh, look at the minutes from the last meeting. Any uh, questions, changes, solutions? No. All in favor? Aye. Aye. No abstentions? Denials? So passed. Okay, we'll start the minutes. Okay, very good. Well, everybody, you guys hear us okay on the, that are zoomed in? Yep, we can hear you okay. We're good. Um, all right, well, another journey, another set of, uh, you know, research opportunities. And, um, um, you, can, you know, Kaylor sent out the information over the weekend, or last Friday, so we've got a chance to digest. I know there's some amendments uh, to it. Uh, once again, it looks like you guys have done a great deal of research. It looks pretty thorough. Uh, and we look forward to your presentation. So who's going to start? Um, we can start. Do you want to go first, Jack? Yep, I can go first. Uh, so I took a look at uh, the towns of uh, East Hartford and Windsor, um, but starting with East Hartford, um, we took a look at the mill rate, uh, which was 49.11, uh, um, which reflected a $3.71 increase over the past five years and a 14.69 increase over the past 10 years. Um, a, they did have, um, for their grand list, a total of $3 billion, $200 million around that. And then uh, the net was $2 billion, $800 million, which was only a 0.8 increase from the previous year. Um, I have listed the top 10 property owners of the town. Um, and then there's a breakdown of the um, type of sectors and industries that they have. Um, but I mainly saw um, uh, there was big utilities, big manufacturers, um, and then they did have some education um, and some real estate. But I think the uh, key thing uh, was uh, their website because they did have a pretty good website. Um, and they advertised uh, the incentive zones that they had for businesses, um, the first being the enterprise zone and the next being a uh, railroad um, depot zone. Um, and these qualifying businesses uh, could get a five-year 80% abatement for the local property tax and a 10-year 25-state corporate business tax credit. Um, and so they did have a lot of incentives, and they were clearly listed on the website, which was uh, really nice for me, obviously, doing the research, but I think for businesses looking, having that information accessible. Um, and then I did find a long list of um, uh, announcements in the media. Um, they're all together announcing different um, changes in businesses from the towns. Um, and so in the past five years, it, um, in the local papers, it was announced that some businesses had either ex expanded or s were starting their businesses in the town. Um, the biggest uh, business that I saw being announced in the past five years um, was uh, Pratt & Whitney, which was an engineering and um, an engineering company, um, and they created a $180 million uh, engineering and technology center. Um, which increased um, the amount of jobs that they have in the actual town. Um, for Windsor, the mill rate uh, was $32.38, um, which yeah. reflected. Wait, can you? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah before you go on, um, let's just open it up for questions. And I would appreciate it. Just take a minute and share with the group what the objective of your research was. Sure. So our objective was to look at the um, uh, how what kind of businesses they were attracting and uh, what kind of uh, income they were generating from the town off the businesses. Um, and we also decided to look at um, what exactly uh, the what what exactly was attracting the new businesses, and particularly. Um, what resources were available uh, coming from, from coming out from other towns into the town for new businesses? Yeah, we're basically looking for like a success metric. So they're doing these things. Is it working for them? Are they seeing success in the businesses they're attracting? Uh, their mill rate, their grand list. What kind of success are they seeing? Are is the the things they are doing working for them? 
Did, did you also look at um, existing businesses expanding as you get versus new businesses moving into town as well? Yeah. Um, sometimes it's hard to figure out. Like there would be like multiple expansions of the same business over in the course of the five years. They'd be like expanding twice. Um, so the numbers are sometimes kind of hard to pin down, but yes. Okay, good, excellent. So along the along our journey here, um, you know, we need to make economic developers, I think, folks, so that you understand what you're trying to market, right? So let's say we start projecting, doing that research. Let's let's take a minute and say, how does it compare to Wallingford? What what are our takeaways? Um, I'd like to share with you. You mentioned an enterprise zone. That's something that we haven't discussed as a group yet. Um, and I will say that Wallingford has no enterprise zones. Right? So an enterprise zone is something that is a state designation that you have to get approved by the state legislature. If you approve an area as an enterprise zone, that enterprise zone is, is eligible for, as you saw, Jack, in your research proves out, an 80% tax abatement for five years. Now, what that means is that the municipality is saying, well, oh, wait a minute, I'm not so sure I want to give up 80% of the tax revenue, but the state of Connecticut is like, no, no, don't worry, we're going to pay the tax. So the municipality is going to call. There's a caveat, however, and the caveat is that if the state at any particular time decides that they no longer have the means to fund that discounted tax program, then they stop paying it. All right, so for example, there was a, the Bristol Myers Strip property you heard us talk about longer. One of our local legislators wanted to make that an enterprise zone. And we fought against it and said, we don't want it to be an enterprise zone because we don't trust the fact that the state is at some point going to say, we're not going to fund it. And lo and behold, two years ago, the state bailed on all the enterprise zone tax credits because they didn't have the money. So right now, enterprise zones throughout Connecticut are not being reimbursed. Municipalities are not being reimbursed by the state. Is the state pulled that, you know, that, that played that card that said they didn't have the fund. So Wallingford is taking the position that we would like to have control of our own destiny and not necessarily rely on the state of Connecticut. All right, so I'm not saying enterprise zones are bad things, but they're necessarily, they, they fit in some cases, they don't fit in others. All right, so I just, there's not, there was an, an opportunity for me to share that with you. Uh, and, and then the surface of enterprise zone may sound like such a great solution, but in some cases it may not necessarily be the case. So. And I think it's probably important also to everything because the enterprise zones need to be approved by the state, there has to be a reason that they would approve them because they're going to subsidize it. So they're offering to subsidize it with other people's tax money to specific towns. And typically they grant that to the press, more depressed economic towns. So to be to have an enterprise zone sounds wonderful uh, on the surface, but it, it, it also exposes to a lot of other underlying needs and, uh, and uh, factors that are not desirable. So uh, you know that's something to consider too. If you have a very robust economic town, you probably wouldn't be in an enterprise zone in the first place because it's limited. The funds are limited, and so they're going to make sure they interject into the press areas. Very, very struggling. So it's one of those life lessons that say when someone comes and, and they hand you an opportunity, make sure you do your homework because nothing's for nothing. Yeah. In this particular case, you know, we're not at least bit disappointed that we did not uh, accept clear on trade and have the Bristol Marriage Group property enterprise zone. And as a matter of fact, we're entertaining a uh, development opportunity on that site right now, which would be a full taxation. So you know, it's, uh, I, I say at the end of the day, every business deals a poker hand, and I don't play cards, by the way, and I don't gamble. But it's always a matter of, well, what is there going to do? If I do this, it's just, you know, that's that just business in general. So, anyway, very good. Any other questions on these characters? Um, no, but I, I'm not sure that you finished with your presentation. Well, no, the other towns. no, no, I mean, I'm just I have one town left. Yeah, I understand that, but are you finished with East Hartford, or do you have more to say about East Hartford? No, I'll, I'll start with East, East Hartford. Well, then you, if you want. Uh, so for East Hartford, I mean, sorry, for Windsor, um, uh, the uh, 
Town's net uh, grand list in 2019 was around three billion, uh, 100 million, uh, and this was a 1.5 in uh, percent increase over the previous years. Again, I had listed the top 10 property owners of the town, and we saw similar uh, industries and uh, sectors of business ranging from uh, manufacturing to retail um, and transport and warehousing was uh, pretty big for the area. Um, the town's website was probably the best website I've seen um, for any town in Connecticut so far through my research. Um, they laid out all the information that they had. They had um, all the information really organized from businesses, um, resources that they could do. They had a section where you can specifically ask questions. Um, and their main strategy uh, from what I saw on the website was mainly focusing on the quality of life in the town. So um, most of their, um, you know, their, um, you know, window marketing, if you would, if you would, like the main thing that you saw was um, things that would attract um, uh, employees to the town rather than uh, necessarily the business. Um, so they focused on what kind of activities they had, um, what kind of uh, wages that were um, averaging in the town, but they also included business incentives um, as um, as the tabs like that. Um, for the um, local papers announcing businesses activity, um, they saw 11 businesses either expanding or starting business in the town over the past five years. Um, the most prominent being Amazon in 2015. They opened up a warehouse uh, leading to an estimated 500 jobs. Um, and then they did lose, um, I believe it was two businesses over that same time period. Um, they either moved out of the town or restructured, uh, causing a loss of jobs. Um, but the information on their website um, was very well organized. Um, I would recommend looking at uh, Windsor's uh, economic department website and the website in general, because it really is a good model for, I think, how um, a town's uh, website should be structured. Questions? All right, I can move on to any of the other three towns that we have listed. So I'm going to start by talking about Philarco, which is in Massachusetts. Um, the biggest thing that I think was mentioned with Philarco was that, let me find, um, it was that they worked directly with the businesses to connect them with the resources they were looking for. So the best example of this that I found was a business that was looking to, you know, consider go to a consultant college in Sarah Lago system. And their main concern was an access to a growing skilled labor force that had that had the exact uh, type of labor skills that they wanted. And so what Miller did was they connected them. There's a local technical high school near them. And they connected the business directly with the high school so they could help with the curriculum so that they knew the workforce they were getting out of that high school could directly help them and work for them in the ways that they needed them to. So that was a big way of how Miller drove in business. And they, they were also really successful. It was a lot harder to find exact information about um, businesses joining or expanding. But the information that you see about how many businesses are in Villarica shows that they are good at retaining businesses and working with the businesses. Um, a couple other companies that I did find that moved there in the past 10 years were a pharmaceutical company. They had a GE headquarters for their recommended and control. Um, and then they had a couple other little medical type businesses moving in. So they were really successful. And that was the biggest thing for them, I think, was just how well they worked with the businesses. So that would be something to definitely consider is if you can connect a business with a resource that's helpful and showing them that you're willing to work with them. Uh, for Brantford and Southington, I think one of the biggest things with the Connecticut towns, every other Connecticut town we looked at had a higher mill rate than Wallingford did, uh, either by a lot, like, um, uh, I think one of them was like a $20. Twenty dollars higher than ours, and a couple were like one or two dollars higher. East Hartford was twenty dollars. Yeah. Um, and then with Branford, had a lot of success. 
there were at least 15 new and exchange businesses entering the area in the past five years. And as you said, a lot of them were medical um, research or manufacturing plants. And the way that they attract medical research plants are that they they started by trying to attract them, so they had a few, and then they used those few to kind of market that they're good at this and they can sustain these types of businesses. Um, another way is that the uh, land that they have for sale, they try to make it more useful and technical oriented. So the office space will have lab spaces, will already have some of that equipment available so they don't have to do as much remodeling when they enter um, in their leases. Um, they also get a lot of state aid, Brantford does. Um, they get state aid mostly for medical businesses uh, to help attract them. Um, so they've been working with the governor for a while with that. Um, How did you determine the state aid? Um, it was one of the, it was in a news article. I don't remember what the like name for it was, but it was a grant that they had received and were working directly with the like a governor's branch to get the state aid when they had one of these businesses who were looking into their sites. It was basically just to give them more money to work with the business to like, attract them, give them better deals to better attract them into the town. Was it with the Department of Economic Development? Yeah, for sure. So they have time to that? Yeah. Get that one. They, you, you mentioned 15 new businesses, new or expanding businesses in the last five years. Do you know the size of those businesses? I, mean, what, uh, um, I don't have exact sizes. I do have a list of their names, um, but I didn't actually look into their exact sizes. I mean, you said that they're substantial businesses because we, we get 45 to 50 new or expanding businesses every year. Yeah, these aren't restaurants or anything that size. Parlors or no, these yes. are all some sort of manufacturing or research and development, mm -hmm. uh, science, technology lab. Substantial. Yes. Thanks. Yes. Yeah. Well, do you know if Brantford, when they develop these buildings, it, 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 it sounds like these buildings are there ready to be, uh, they're unoccupied initially. <laughs> You know, Brantford actually participates with the state, for example, to only rehab those buildings before they're rented, or were they built by another company that left another? Do you know I, how they approach that? I don't know exactly. I'm, I know some of them were already rehabbed by companies previously, so they were already had some of the facilities like made to be lab worthy. Mm -hmm. um, I, I do think some of it is probably from the state with how they're working with the state to get businesses. I don't have an exact answer though. That's just an assumption based on what my reading was. Okay, that's interesting. You know, we have some we have some well, we have a lot of office space in town, so those uh, but it's just office space. Yeah. So that would be something on a proactive basis. Is that something that they're taking advantage of with subsidies from the state to help them develop those buildings before they're rented? And that when they go out to attract businesses, as you suggested, they they have an advantage over other towns. The person I interviewed, Mr. Rigorn, he converted an office space into like a manufacturing space because it was light manufacturing. So maybe with the long term, they can kind of change their their meaning in like office spaces. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And he was a private developer that you spoke to this year. Yeah. He um, works for uh, Radial and he creates like kind of fiber optics, uh, antennas, like kind of signals. So. Okay. 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 So I think the, I guess the question in my mind, uh, Brent, is, is public private partnerships. And where is that line drawn? You know, Cameron, your example, Mr. Rigolon, he's the, he's the president of Radial. Uh, which is a French-owned, privately-owned company, and when they converted that office building to a small manufacturing, we were very involved with that. Again, it allowed them to do that business in that zone. Recognizing that there are office buildings in Wallingford, but the office market is so soft that how many of them are can, can be converted to something else? Some of them, frankly, the way they're built, are never going to be any other than office building. It's just the way that they're built. It's just going to be very hard to retrofit. Yeah. This was a weird we record, but that was all of his money. It was private money, um, you know, no tax incentives, no state help, no nothing, no private money. And Brantford, you're suggesting, Brent, is a, is a public partnership 
for the state is assisting um, private property owners. Because at the end of the day, remember, the town is not owning the property. So no matter who, whose name is on the deed, who's collecting the rent. So these are private property owners that are getting, or you're suggesting you're getting some sort of state help to retrofit their, their building to accommodate lab space. The one thing about lab space is it's very, very expensive to convert a vanilla box to a lab. Right? Lots of stainless steel. Just think of what goes into a lab, you know, air quality, I and mean, it's just vibration. I mean, there's so many different things, right? We have some great buildings that we, that we work for. So I'm really interested. I'm not aware of any state programs that would take and, and, and assist. Um, so I'd be interested in finding out more about that. I'll look further into what the state is doing, how they connect with their department. So. Thank you for that. Um, the last time I looked at is Southington, which honestly they haven't done much to attract businesses. Um, I couldn't find any that were added. In the last few years, the only two that I found that were of any substance, they were restaurant or anything, was a food recycling plant and a third party logistics facility. Um, both of those were pretty long ago. I think they were in the early, like, 2010s. Um, other than that, I couldn't really find anything. They do have listings on their website for industrial manufacturing and just land that they have for sale rooms in the town, but it doesn't seem that much is happening in terms of getting that land sold. Um, they don't really have much going on as an efforts to attract businesses into their town. Um, their website isn't well conducive for business information. Um, so I don't think they're the best to look at for information on what is going right. <laughs> They haven't seen much success. Well, they have a good PR because it seems like they make their rules attracting businesses. <laughs> but they make, they, but they may be restaurants. I think they are, yeah. Because uh, <laughs> you know, I can find, find anything about like businesses going to Yeah, now that you mention it, I mean, <clears throat> in my mind, I'm thinking, boy, they're really <laughs> trying to attract new businesses. You see it in the press all the time. But now that you mention it, I said, I can't really remember any big thing going on. Yeah. Yeah, I think. Because I found a, Jack connected me to a, like a spreadsheet of businesses that entered towns, what year, mm -hmm. what their like, um, like industry was. Yeah. And Southern was like, I had like 12 picks when I searched for Southern like, Kid. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's very helpful. Restaurant, restaurant, yeah. restaurant. Yeah. <laughs> well, they've had a lot of internal expansion with ESPN over the years, the last 10 years, that a lot of their focus has been on that. And, and also the uh, downtown, right? They're going downtown. The downtown, yeah. What's up is the Wally's Correct, yeah. But I, of all these towns, I look at Southington, uh, that's probably the most economically related to our for in terms of, uh, you know, per capita income and location and things that nature. So, yeah, I agree with the population. Yeah, yeah, very close. They, they feed it up the, the, a lot. ESPN happens to be in Bristol, but it, it's mm -hmm. like, you know, it's a nightmare from the southern border to the, to the, you know, the, the satellite dishes at ESPN, so it's really, really close. But the ESPN folks, they frequent selling the businesses, you know, etc. Yeah. But as ESPN goes into the southern team, they were expecting to make a lot of that business just in those. So, you know, an interesting thing that's come out of not just this meeting, but the last several, is you know, when I came into this, and I came into this with people saying, you know, websites, yeah, not that important. It's getting your message out on social media, reaching more people through social media. And what I'm hearing now, and a lot of your research, frankly, seems to be based on evaluations of websites. Um, and we're gonna hear about the SEO components and so forth. But what I'm hearing is, is, and correct me if I'm misinterpreting this, but you know, the websites are very important because it's, it's a matter of driving eyeballs to the websites so people can really see who you are. Is that a fair statement at this point? Yeah, I agree. I think any social media work is to bring people to the website. And then you need to have a well with that website for them to stay interested in your town. Yeah. You mentioned uh, one of the towns that have next on Windsor. Yeah, one of the towns that have next on Windsor. What, what made it an excellent website? 
Uh, that was Windsor's website. Um, I just thought that the information that they had, um, you know, past towns had the information, but it was like just regurgitated all over like website. You really had to dig for it. Whereas Windsor's was very clean, very user friendly. It looks nice, but it also had like uh, different sections you could click on in the economic development page. Um, so you could go, uh, you know, business incentives, or you can look at quality of life. You know, they had different sections with organized information um, that uh, made it really accessible for not only the businesses who are looking for resources or trying to find out what um, industries are there currently, but also for, I believe the people that are going to be the ones living there, you know, the employees also had to you know, talk about quality of life. It talked about, um, you know, the, um, amenities that the town had and, and things like that. So I think a big part of it was the organization because there have been towns that have the information. They just didn't show it in a good way. It's about the presentation, I think mostly. Sometimes I, I, I keep told with websites or anything uh, digital is it's the number of clicks. So if you click to get into the website, there's one click. And now you want a, some information on EDC, well, then there's another click. And then beyond that click is what you're saying. You, you want to get more specific so they don't keep clicking to try to get to where they want to be. It's, it's pretty open. Am, am I right in saying it that way? Or did you notice? Yeah. That? I think that there's a, a, a line between it. You know, you don't want people having to click um, so many times where the information is just too deep for them to have. You want to have it, you know, um, easy for them. So, you know, I think it's like one to three clicks. The information should be there, but the information should be organized all, as well. So if the person clicks once and all the information is on one page, then they have to go through and search for through all the information to find exactly what they're looking for. If you have some level of organization, it's really easy to go, okay, economic department, I'm looking at businesses, I'm looking at resources. Instead of looking at economic department and then having to scroll through and read, you know, you know, dozens of paragraphs to find, you know, oh, here are the resources that I'm looking for, or here are the incentives that I'm looking for. So Windsor's website um, did a good job of organizing it, but also just it, you know, compared to the other towns too, it didn't feel dated. Like a lot of the time, I feel like I look at a website and it feels like it came out of like a, like a, the beginning of the internet. It looked like it was the first website to ever be created on, on online. So Windsor's website, I think was a, a really good um, model, particularly the economic, economic department. Hey, Jeff. Yeah. Um, yeah. What's running through my mind now is um, I wonder how often they update. I wonder what type of resource commitments that they have on their website. I mean, the mill rate's the mill rate, the mill rate. You don't update that. The square miles of the town, I and mean, there's certain things that are just staying. But I mean, what do they do to make it look new, fresh? Or is it just a well designed website that you know, they go in and revisit every six months? Um, any chance we can get you to do some more digging on that? Yep, definitely. I'll I'll look into it. So Jack, let's uh, after this meeting or you know in the next day or so, touch base with me if you would. And I will give you the economic developer's name, contact information, and what I'll do is I will call him ahead of time and let him know the project we're working on, and then let him know that you'll be reaching out to him to get, you know, or have him give me the proper resource to you know further evaluate your website. Okay. Right. So we'll see your report to reach out to me. Okay. Awesome. Okay, that's the challenge, right? Yeah. Nice just work on it. Okay. I think. So, John, uh, John was saying that you're going to start the next section. Oh, 
Sorry, I didn't hear that. Um, cool. Okay. Uh, let me share my screen. So based on our last meeting, we had compared Wallingford to a couple of the major urban areas that we were citing as uh, major labor markets. And so since then, we've gone back and compared Wallingford to all the different references that the other groups looked at when we're comparing uh, very similar town structures that are looking to kind of attract and also grow their economic activity. Um, so we compared them against Southington, North Haven, Billerica, Nagatuck, and Fairfield. Um, and just looking at the, uh, the scatter plot, you can see that um, they're roughly, roughly the same when it comes to being progressive or conservative with uh, Fairfield having more resources available, obviously. And so they have a lot more social programs uh, in place that they advertise throughout their website. And when we compare it to um, being young and old, you can see pretty clearly that Longford does stand out as being skewed on the older side. And they have um, significantly less people under the age of 18 than the other uh, than the other towns on display. Um, and so this is just useful information. We're looking at whether or not it makes more sense to be uh, attracting people from nearby towns to come and work in Wallingford or looking to uh, position the Wallingford residents as being a primary component uh, to advertise and um, an appealing labor force um, that's easily accessible. And uh, John. Okay. So, question. Is that going to be Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, we found that the four major market factors of this set um, were uh, financial incentives, infrastructure, workforce, and quality of life. Um, so, we kind of saw how Longford had all four of those and why this is the one move there. So, for financial incentives, we found that it was inexpensive electric water and milling. Um, tax center programs and inexpensive real estate. Um, and for infrastructure, we saw that it was via access to railroads and access to major state highways, along um, with uh, reliable electricity. Um, workforce, we found that it was uh, close to large urban areas, as well as being close to uh, major labor markets like New Haven and Hartford. Um, in quality of life, we found that uh, there were great access to basic public amenities as well as nearby hiking destinations. So kind of like giving it a very homey feel and a place that people can do activities, you know, like family oriented activities. Um, yeah, that was kind of what we found to be quality of What was the second component? Uh, Oh, so John, are those in any particular order? Um, no, no, no particular order. That's just kind of like we just found those are the four major ones, and then the, the, they all tie together, making it like a place that is one move. How do we? How do we? Go ahead. One of the one of the takeaways, especially after looking at, um, I was actually just looking through the the Windsor CT website too. They, they spend a lot of time focusing on all of the um, benefits for residents and really harping on emphasizing the quality of life component, which is something that um, I think the Wallingford website doesn't really look at at all. Um, and so when we're looking at the different areas and the qualitative factors that we think the website really brings to the forefront, it's much more heavily skewed towards emphasizing the financial incentives and the infrastructure rather than the, the workforce and quality of life that I think is also an equally important component um, of positioning. So what, I, what I'm hearing and, and living with, so it's not just inter somebody's interpretation, but um, access to workforce is number one. By far, number one. Now, intuitively, we start thinking about, you know, I think you know, your research had 19 universities within the next number of miles, so within the gravel distance. Um, but it's also, it's, it's general labor. It's new course steel, wanting to make sure that they can, you know, they can take a pop 
lick your floor. It's Amazon looking for warehouse workers. It's, now there's, there's a fair amount of that. So it, it's labor all across the spectrum. It's not just you know, educated labor or overly educated, formally educated, I should say. Um, it's it's all, all labor across the board. Um, you know, the, the cost, you know, five years ago, the cost was, was on the top of five. Now the cost has fallen and access to labor is number one. Now, your research has shown um, something that we're aware of, and that is that, you know, the age demographic in Hollywood skews older. And it's only skewed a little bit older in the last five years. It says we're not, we're not attracting nor are we keeping the younger people in the community, which, which is a challenge. So I think I want to plant that seed. So if we're designing websites or social media messaging or what have you, we need to take and keep that in, in mind, saying that those are, the, those are the people that we want to try to reach, saying that there are great opportunities uh, here. I just want to clarify something on the expense side. Um, first off, when we talk about mill rates, right? Mill rate is, is I, I call it a partial score, right? So mill rate is one component of a calculation that is used to determine the tax that you're going to collect on a particular piece of property. So for example, in Wallingford, we know our mill rate is $29 and change. All right, in East Harbor, it's forty nine dollars a change. But the other the other piece of that uh, um, equation is the value of the property. Now, I will say that if you take building A in Wallingford, you take that exact building and put it in East Harbor, it's not going to have the same value. So and it, it just doesn't work that way. So a way that communities can help balance mill rate disparity is by property value. I will say right to our north, the city called Meriden. Meriden is considered by the state standard the, the distressed city. So you take you take a five hundred thousand dollar office building in Wallingford, you put that same office building in Meriden, and I'll bet you it's going to go. It's going to be assessed at three fifty. All right. So and then you apply their mill rate, and then you apply our mill rate to our value, and it, it starts to level. A bit, although frankly, in most cases, are still extremely competitive. The one thing that does not get skewed along the way, oh, by the way, our water rates, although we have a publicly owned water utility, our water rates are not this discounted when you compare them across. They're, they're very, very equalized. All right, so what's happened over the last decade or so is that um, through efficiency programs, almost exclusively through efficiency programs, that our water rates have actually gone up because the volumes have gone down precipitously. <laughs> so, um, so our water rates are not something that we want to go out and boast about being competitive or low because they're really not. They're, they're, they're competitive. They're not high, but they're not low. And lastly, in the cost spectrum, so those really are the three things driving right cost. It's the electric. Now we've talked about the lowest electric in, in Connecticut and so forth. Well, I received a report from our head of our public utilities uh, department this past week. And our electric rates are actually the lowest in all of New England. Now, he made a promise that we would not go out and say that, because he does not want to create some sort of a storm that he can not back up, because everything is measured in, 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 a, in a point in time. So it was July, compared to electric rates throughout New England, Wallingford was the, was the cheapest. So as we're formulating, as you guys are formulating, how are we going to promote this community? If we think of communities outside of Connecticut, across the country, wherever, you know, reasonable reach for us in terms of, you know, practical reach, they're, they're looking at, A, there's a fair part of that figure out. The one for cheapest rates in New England, Connecticut, the highest electric rates in the entire continental United States. That's what drove this report. All right, so the only ones that are higher than us are last in the way. The highest electric rates in the continental United States. But Wallingford, there's this little dot on the map called Wallingford that's got the cheapest in New England. So, how do we, the, you know, the, the, uh, uh, the brand, the reputation is being developed outside the state that it's, it's too expensive to do business there. Now they've got the highest cost of power in the entire continental United States. Yeah. But, and how do we say, well, well wait a minute, we're 
lines are, are different, right? How do we get, and that's going to be part of what, what we need you guys to be focusing on is taking our strengths and then making sure that we can override the reputation that's been developed, that is actively being developed right now. About connecting. About connecting. We look for we look for people who are heavy energy users because of us or our power. But the fact of the matter is, heavy energy users are discounting New England right now, saying, "Don't even go near that. It's way too expensive." And because of um, you know state law that has regulated and mandated, frankly, renewable energy consumption and production to continue to grow over the next ten years, right, it's driving. It costs three times more to produce a kilowatt using wind and solar than it does natural gas. Now, I'm not making any testaments in terms of environmental or something. It's not, it's just, those are the business facts. Three times more. So we already have the number one cost of power in the country, and we, we are insisting that 35% of our power grid by the year 2025 be uh, renewable, which is going to drive the cost higher and higher and higher. Just people like myself talking to the legislature on a regular basis saying, please, we all appreciate the goals. We understand it. We get it. But you are going to drive businesses out of here, and you're going to prevent businesses from coming. So all that said, um, one of still got the cheapest power, and we think it's very sustainable. Why? Because as a private business, we don't have to buy the renewal. Matter of fact, um, David, we had talked about taking this whole group on a tour of water at some point and get it back for you today. So you can see the product of the parking. But you will see that we have this enormous solar power grid that's just been from the press and being built along. It's on our own, it's on our old landfill. Highest and best use of an old landfill. Absolutely. What else could you use it for, right? So, well, actually, my hometown we converted a landfill into a ski mountain. Oh, that's right. Oh, that's so, <laughs> so, it's a slightly different way of doing the same, uh, yeah. generating revenue. But uh, yours, I think, is more sustainable. <laughs> so, as an example, you know, so we've got this huge solar power grid in the rest of the hill, and Wallingford refused to buy the power because it's too less expensive. So, what happens? is Eversource, by virtue of legislation, has to buy it. So they're forcing Eversource to buy it, and it's going to drive prices even higher. So that's, that's part of the business dilemma that we have. We're, we're like this little spot on the map, not only even connected to New England, because outside there, people that are using a fair amount of energy aren't even looking in this direction. All right, so we've got the cost component, we've got the talent, the you know, acquisition, and the component. So all that kind of fits in place again. I think I had to what Ken was saying with the pricing and how our power is, what it is, um, is also, and it's a big part of it, is the reliability of the power. Because we're only for it is when itself running the power unit, they make sure the trees are cut for, they, they put in special wiring, along with the wires, so if a tree falls on it, it doesn't break the wires, like in most other areas it breaks the wire. Longer did all of these things over years to make the redundancy, make the reliability of it 99 point something. And so, what we had these last storms, I think anybody in Longford was probably out for maybe two hours or four hours or something like that, and that was, and that was very few people. But it, most of the time, had power, when Cheshire right next door to us was out for five days, you know, that type of thing. So if you're a company that has to have an engine or a motor or manufacturing that has to keep running, mm -hmm. you can, you put in generators, make sure it does that, but one of your reliability is saying you can put your, your manufacturing in Wallingford because chances are you're going to have your power going right away. I have coolers to cool my beer and draft beer, and they're never down. They're just never down. You know, so that's always nice to know because you can have spoilage out there. I, I, I'd like to just add one more thing to this to kind of summarize some of the things that Tim and uh, Mark were saying. You're young. You haven't, you know, you, you haven't run a company. Uh, so when you do these projects, everything in real life is relative. So when you say, well, well these are all the nice factories that want for that, that means nothing. 
What means is how do they differentiate from other surrounding towns? When you look for a car, you have a list of things that you want, but you're, you're going to shop around and see which of those car manufacturers, and then you're going to start comparing prices. It's no different than running a company, with the exception is when you run a company, you might have 10, 50, 500 people that depend on you. You've got to meet payroll. you got to meet liability issues. There's a lot of complexity. So unlike public entities, profits and finances are very critical to the success of the business. So access to labor force, it's all about how does that, how does that, how, how that going to help me grow and be competitive? So everything does it ultimately, is we can talk about all these esoteric quality of life, it's all very important. But as Tim pointed out, there's a priority list that companies have to go on. So they're going to first take a look at what areas are going to best suit their business from a financial perspective. It could be logistics, it could be a number of other issues financially. Then they're going to, I can't read in this thing. Then they're going to, then they're going to line up those, half of they're going to narrow down those areas of the country. They're going to narrow down the areas once of New England, then they're going to narrow down which part of New England, for example, New England versus South Carolina or wherever. It, it, then they're going to nail down the areas within that they select Connecticut over a number of other states, and they're going to pick within Connecticut. You can start narrowing that down. But everything's done on a relative basis. So whenever you're coming up with facts, it's always important to keep in mind. How does that compare to the competition constantly? That's the question you got to ask yourself all the time. And it's all relative. So as Tim said, and then we have to find what makes us better and if we can't find anything, then we have to develop that. That's an area, some area that we need to work on, like the websites and things like that. Um, but again, uh, we, we emphasize that. And then I think, then we have to maybe decide, okay, that's our differentiator. What companies are going to find that track? And that's how we start mirroring it down. So. Okay, want to go into the next area? No, I just had a question for Callum. So, Callum uh, and, and Jeff, based on your research on brand analysis, um, what, what are my top two or three takeaways here? So, I think the, the key takeaways from uh, looking at this, I think that we need to be doing a lot more to position Longford as a place that also has a high quality of life. I think that there's kind of a, a minimum barrier for a quality of life that companies look at when they're looking to transfer to new um, new areas as well. And so if we can look at bringing that up as well, um, other aspects like the, the cheap electric uh, and milling rates would be better positioned for companies that also require um, you know, a certain standard of quality of life. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, well said. Mm -hmm. Just a matter of, of uh, and to correct you, but there, there's no ING on mill. All right? It, it's mill rate. Mill rate mill is not milling. Milling is, a, milling is a process that you see in the machine shop. It's a mill it is. Rate. Oh. All right. All right. Very good, guys. Thank you. Um, so we took a look at such a optimization and Broadway is a process of giving your website the correct ingredients to be found in searches. So that relates to like the content on your page, it relates to the titles, it relates to anchor text and the overall reputation of the website. Um, so Titles are using the search engine as a, like a book cover. So it says like, this is just the general, um, like the general layout of the page. Basically what, what SEO is, it's trying to tell the search engines what is on your page so that the search engines can better suit the searcher. It's, it's giving that a relationship where like, the website needs to be optimized for both the, the search engines and the people who are reading it. Um, so one thing that I, I'll uh, point out specifically is the reputation. Um, I thought that was interesting that like websites have reputations just like I guess people do. And so with a reputation, it, you have to create new engaging content and um, you have to have like 
links to your website, so I can necessarily know how um, a government thing would have would be creating content. That that was one fear that I had for this project. Um, but there's two ways to get higher in the search results, and that's broadly through SEO, which is obviously uh, in your website like more optimized. But then there's price per click or um, cost per click, and that is you go on say Google AdWords and you pay specifically for keywords. So you say I want to be listed on. Um, commercial real estate within, say, this location, and then Google will give you um, prices based on like, the type of search. So, and you could also list the max price that you would like to pay, um, and that's, yeah, that's the cost per click. Then you also have a different version of that, which is cost per like, impression, which, so I could say I want to be in front of this many people, um, and I'll pay this amount of money. So um, those are like the costs. Um, what I realized is that um, certain keywords, like if you go broader, then it's harder to get with uh, get higher on the search results through, uh, through SEO, but it's slightly easier to get higher on the search results through the cost per click. And um, I did this using like a system that like searches through the keyword and searches the difficulty of the SEO and yeah, and look at the volume of it. Um, uh, when you have like a less specific, I mean a more specific um, search then it, the volume obviously goes down which makes it easier to um, search for i mean to create as there's it's less competitive I mean, it's less competitive for seo but it's more competitive for the cost per click and um it's if you have a really specific um search that tends to be the it tends to follow the trend where it's easier to to achieve um, a higher search result through SEO, but it's harder because those people are deeper in a niche that a business wants to fill. So um, it's harder for cost per click. More competitive. Um, I I we wrote a little bit about like how to optimize your website, and so it. Basically, since there's two kind of um, there's two sections of a website, and that's the back end, which is the coding and the thing that the computer reads, and then there's the words that we read. We want to minimize like the the coding and like the difficult code. Um, so that's like you want to have uh, less frames and like less difficult things with the they're called crawlers for the, the website and the search engines to look through. Um, and you also want to describe your page as best as you can. So that's like, if you have an image on your website, you want to have uh, alternative keywords describing basically what that image it was. And it's also better to have a new image so that when the search engines look through your, your website, it shows, oh, this is different, this is interesting, people might like this more. Um, keywords are big. Um, there's two keywords, two types of keywords. One is, again, in the coding, and then the other is actually on the content of the page. And it puts a higher weight of the first 100 words. So you really want to get your keywords in the first couple of 100 words. Um, anchor text is, so say you have a blog post and he's creating a lifestyle blog and he says, I have this recipe for this, um, he could link the, like, I have the uh, apple pie recipe, like, click here, and the word, like, apple pie, you can just a link in, so when I click on the word apple pie, it'll bring you to that link, but on the SEO side, 
what it does is it it describes the page that you're going to so that it, the uh, search engines have again better context so that SEO is just giving context to what like, every page. Um, also, like, the amount of shares and the amount of like, social engagement is important for SEO. Um, like, if I share it with, on social media, on Facebook, on LinkedIn, whatever it may be, the, the websites also, the search engines engage that and weight it um, accordingly so that it shows that this website has a, a better reputation or a better uh, information on the website. I have some info. So um, I focused largely on just the implementation and a lot of the issues that um, typically arise and so we can focus on that and make sure that um, we mitigate the damages in that sense. So um, the most common issues typically come up when it comes to tracking the results of the search engine optimization and using those keywords and specifically um, how you you measure your success. And the first step in doing that would be establishing a baseline. So that just led me to a, a list of questions that I think um, I, I don't believe we've had answered yet, but I, I did some of my own research and I found that the, the Wallingford website right now, the host is Cloudfair. Um, but do we have someone, I, I don't know if anyone in this room is specifically responsible for being like the the website manager who who makes the updates do we have um uh, an also, we, we we have someone here and we have someone in the uh in the government in the town that does that but that person's not here it okay um we haven't met with them yeah correct <laughs> Sam, do right. you have your list of do you have like a list of questions that we could send as an email to that person yeah yep cool. So um, I guess, I don't know if anyone here would know the answers to this. So I think my, my next follow-up question would be, um, can we get in contact with whoever is um, be, uh, making those updates and making those changes? Um, and the industry standard, just based on my limited experience specifically with search engine optimization and just in my research alone, um, and given the, the global state of the internet, Google Analytics, and Google Tag Manager are the industry standard, and they've become the industry standard. So I don't know if we already have an existing infrastructure on the, web, the website now that that we can have access to the information of um, how many clicks we get in a day right now so that we can establish that baseline and move forward from there and kind of strategize where we want to be and start setting actionable, like, um, measurements. So my research kind of took me in a roundabout circle of like, we need to ask more questions before I can go deeper. Um. Okay, that's great. So for everybody's application, um, there's a third party that manages the website. So they're the, they're the, uh, the host. Yep. Uh, and then there's a, an individual named Lynn. She has to be my administrative assistant. She actually uploads information. So she uses a template and you know and she does it for the entire town. So public work says, okay, we're gonna pick up leaves at curbside from this state to this state. They send her the information, a little template, she types it in, and that's the extent of what's going on. I agree that what's coming out in terms of next assignments <laughs> is A, we have to understand the technological capabilities of our website. Now this could be, I, I don't know enough about this stuff. I hope they've been to that from day one, but this is website and box type stuff. I don't know how much flexibility we have. We have to determine that, all right? Um, uh, you know, Calum, it's, it's, uh, you know, you're, you're a web designer. So if, if we have more flexibility, then how do we best leverage it? And given your, your research in terms of SEO keywords, I don't know if you're doing anything, right? So, I mean, the opportunities are just robust. If, in fact, 
the web platform we use allows us to do it, right? So we have to make that determination, and, and I think maybe as David, I'll look to you, but we have we have specific talent sets on this team that lend themselves to a couple of different exercises, and I think we should be formulating for our community. Uh, Tim, I have a. Oh, sorry. Excuse me, it's uh, Anthony Bercali. Uh, Tim, uh, just a, a comment. Web Solutions, uh, who's on Research Parkway in Meriden, uh, did the site, and they will have, uh, for you, Samantha, they'll have some baseline analytics. They could tell you uh, anywhere you'd show up, you know, what your, your um, Google searches, they can give you whatever data you want. They'll have it. I, I actually, they did the last website we had here um, so I know the uh, I know the team over there, uh, Tim. I'm sure you can get contacts if you can. I could send you uh, the contacts um, uh, at that uh, at that at that outfit. So. Okay, and you said that was Web Solutions. Yeah, Web Solutions are on Research Parkway in Meriden. Cool. Yeah, that'd be great. And I, I think the my biggest question was just what legal precautions do we need to be aware of when dealing with data that's like government data and things like that. So there's always that question. Um, but I think just from sitting in this meeting, one of my big takeaways is that the research that we've been doing in terms of competitors and everything else is going to <clears throat> help us develop the correct copy and messaging strategy to use with the search engine optimization. So I think it's, it's coming together nicely. I was just gonna say I, I saw that they actually they have Google Tag Manager set up. So, um. cool. So I, I think we're 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 formulating a team. So to understand and great job on web solutions, Calvin. They are in fact the uh, you know the, 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 the people who manage the site for us. So to understand um, what flexibility that we have, um, I don't know. I'm gonna, Maybe Gal want to be on that team. Maybe it should be Gal and Samantha that research that component of it. Samantha, I can put you in touch with Lynn in our office so you understand you know, what she puts up, how she puts it up. Um, we also have to let, let's, let's talk openly about assignments for next time. It's, it's, uh, so I've been taking quite a bit of notes and trying to come up with what would make the most sense because it seems, and I want to talk with you guys. But it seems like we have sufficient information to start formulating a strategy. Yes. Cool. And you guys all feel about the same? Yeah. Cool. Then this is what I am going to propose. That we do have a team that looks specifically at the website and the copy. So Samantha, to what you were saying, and I think that this will mean like shaking up the teams a little bit, which isn't a bad thing. But so looking at the website design and then answering some of those logistics and data questions, but then starting to say, how do we make this look as professional and enticing as possible? How do we make sure that this is optimized for SEO? How do we make sure that there are other sites that want to point to the Wallingford website and not just make it a beautiful standalone site that doesn't really go anywhere? So I think that's going to be part of it. The second is we need to look at the oh, sure. interject that while we're doing that, resources. Right. So ah, so that's why resources. Right. Is it is it something that takes two hours a week, five hours a week, ten hours a week? I mean, how fluid should that kind of development website be? And I'll just share a brief example. Okay. So Mark had mentioned earlier that we were very proud of the fact that. Over the last you know, six consecutive years, we've had over 50 <coughs> five zero new business starts in the town hall. Right? That just doesn't happen. That's resulted in a lot of very focused and a lot of, a lot of hard work. However, I would bet, and I'm not again, I don't know about that again, but I would bet big money that 99.9% .9 of the people in the library have no idea that we've had 50 new businesses. So I sit and say, gosh, every time, I don't care if it's a nail salon, I don't care if it's a restaurant, or if it's radial, frankly, those we do get. We get media attention and we try to, we try to leverage it, everyone's for sure. But there's something that, that says to me, every time we have a success story, we need to be saying, telling that story someplace. And where is the someplace? Mm -hmm. We put it on the website, but we don't drive traffic to the website. 
I'm on stage, right? So how do we tell that story? And that's, so I need, I need someone help me with that too. That would be another sign. What you can do is when the media comes for radio, I'll be locating there. Um, have a link say, like, if you want to get in contact with the Wallingford website or Wallingford EDC, then have a link at the bottom of the article or whatever they, they send out to go to the Wallingford EDC website so that you link build through the SEO and also it gives a point of contact for, for the business owners who happen to be uh, like, I think that's a, that's a good point, but to Tim's point, if people don't get driven to the website, you brought up a good point earlier in, in the, this whole conversation, and that was you got to improve your website, you got to get on the website, but you also have to improve getting people to the website. Yes, it's there. Yeah. <laughs> so, so uh, and it's a part of forcing, I understand that. And I think we're right to focusing on the website first, and then from that, let's build to see how we're going to get people to the website. But at the end of the day, most of the most of the population of Wallingford don't understand a lot of new businesses are opening. They understand two or three radials because they're in the paper, it's a big deal, but not the hair salon, right? Who pay tax dollars, by the way. Barbershop pays tax dollars. Uh, but whatever new little business comes into town pays tax dollars. So we have to tell people, get people to understand that more and more. Because they get depressed about business is terrible. People are out of work, they don't know what's going on, listen to the media. And, and, and that is true in some cases, but in Wallingford, we've got some good things going too. And that's what we have to let people know. So you basically want to find a way to also push that you have these small businesses coming in and that they are doing well as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Exactly. Yeah, and it, it may be you have to have a campaign to promote the campaign. I mean, our campaign is to, to bring new businesses. To your point, it may be a marketing campaign, advertising reaching out over a specific period of time for, say, a month or two, where we develop an app or whatever, the long-term app, whatever, how you want to call it. And we promote it in, in print uh, with banners in town, whatever, to try to get everybody to download it. And now they have a single point of contact. And they hit something with right to the website, and then the website's properly designed. And, you know, people will get in the habit of checking it constantly. Um, but, yeah. And because I think one thing that Tim had referenced that when you develop, when you look into this uh, website, you're going to determine what our current capabilities are, what our structure is, how it's done. But um, if we can't make changes to that without first going through the town council and making proposals and uh, determining costs and all that. But it's important to know this is where we are. This is probably not where we, where we need to be. So it's going to be, you know, you're going to have to do the analysis of where we are, but then again, to your point, this is where you really need to be. And then we got to determine how we how do we get there. But ultimately, it's going to be guys like Tim that have to present this to the town. And it would be interesting for you guys to participate in that and see how that whole process works. It's you know, so that's all that. Cool. So let me see if I have captured everything because I'm typing as you guys have been throwing out more ideas. So for the website design team, identifying the resources of it. Specifically, time, effort, if there's any money that needs to be spent on redesigning the website. But, Jellum and Samantha, to your point, we need the analytics. Um, what will make this site look good, and how do we optimize it for SEO, specifically for the things that we're most interested in? How to get other sites to point to the website? How to make this something people regularly check and interact with? Um, <clears throat> And then how to optimize information and minimize clicking and scrolling through the website so that information is presented early up front. So to Jack's description of uh, which town? Windsor. Windsor, where he was saying the information I needed was one to three clicks deep. So that's what we want to do. So I think that that's the website design subgroup. And then we have our branding design subgroup. And so that is calling out the four key points that John and Callum found, which are the infrastructure, financial incentives, workforce, and quality of life. And even though all, some of them are already more strongly called out, still let's relook at all of them because it doesn't mean that we can't call something out better. We want to make Wallingford stand out from the rest of Connecticut, especially since Connecticut is labeled as a business unfriendly environment. We want people to know, hey, there's an oasis here. How to get stories out about Wallingford and its business community. How to attract businesses, how to attract younger employees, how to rebrand the positives that currently exist, 
how to get the media to want to come to Wallingford regularly, and not just for talking with Tim about what's the government situation, but talking to the small businesses, big businesses, and the people, and possibly even the school system, because that could be part of the quality of life thing. How to push small business growth, as well as big business relocations that are coming in and going on, and creating an overall comprehensive campaign for helping the town succeed in all of its endeavors. Have I missed anything? <laughs> So, I don't think, yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> we'll summarize. Yeah. Yeah. So, before you, before you do that, so I just want to talk about the media part. I'd like to talk about the uh, friend you brought up. I think it was, uh, I forget which community, but um, how they were engaging with the Board of Education. And, but they, you know, firsthand, that's where we met. Yep. So, we are very fortunate that uh, Dr. Sal Mesmer, our superintendent of schools, is, um, he is like, in line with us, 100%. so we have we have um, curriculums in the high school, actually the grammar schools that start. We we are a, a, a STEM self-designated STEM community in the state of Connecticut. So um, we were one of the first, and we have curriculums in grammar school, middle school, and high school that drive um, students still learning to create opportunity. So there, there's a very very um, strong alliance and alignment with economic development and the school system. And that community that you found is benefiting from that, we are benefiting from that for every way as well. So um, to do further research, unless there's something that I'm missing, I think, you know, we're, we're like, we're ahead of the class on that stuff. So I think so. I think that we are at the stage of the brainstorming and starting to compile together a campaign. So let me check for you guys. Is there anything that you guys have questions, ideas that I can capture? One thing that um, Brennan's and Brennan and Jack said was like they uh, one of the towns pointed out specifically their like their I guess technical school and they connected them. What I don't know if this is already happening, but the hubcap could also do the same thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is happening. Uh, the curriculums have been changed within the school system to match manufacturing, for instance. Start with manufacturing, but now Hubcap has brought it up to um, medical, assisting, you know, health and things like that, um, and food service, I and food service. So Hubcap's kind of gotten that anyway. So the school system, through Hubcap, during their curriculum, to meet those needs for those people. Yeah, there's a, out of the tactical high schools, um, right now there's a 98% higher rate directly out of high school. Um, so every, and it's mainly for manufacturing. So, uh, but it, it applies to nursing, it applies to any of the trades. So um, the manufacturers right now are, are in need of another generation of manufacturing talent. That's where they That's where they So they are, they are all over the high schools. High schools are working with them. So. And those, those things are, are very active, and we are very well engaged with uh, You know, so it's, this started a number of years ago when we said that the superintendent of schools, you have thousands of kids at your disposal. And we have companies in this town that have thousands of employees that have aging workforces. There, there needs to be a way to align the two. Now, sometimes the school systems, they look at, you know, they look at, um, no one wants to monetize the school system. We're very sensitive about that. But our superintendent says, we're not monetizing the school system. My job is to prepare students to be able to go out in the world and support themselves and grow and be professionally satisfied. And he's happy to make those alignments. So when it comes to the educational community and the work community and the business community, there's, there's, a, there's a great amount of, of synergistic cooperation. And the superintendent school very simply looks at it this way. If I want to continue to, to provide the best educational product in this community, I need money. And the businesses are the ones that are bringing in the money. And so I better not well support them or I'm going to cut off my own, my own uh, funding service. Right? So we're very well entrenched here. I don't know. Yeah. Anything. So I've actually added on to the rebranding team looking at such partnerships. Uh, looking at Hubcap and other technical connections that exist with the different businesses, and then identifying and creating partnerships with other local resources 
So that would be more strongly potentially with the school system, but also with things like QU. We are literally 10, 15 minutes down the road. So there's no reason why we can't look to build stronger connections with you and opportunities for us to take advantage of cool things over there. Like if we could do more stuff like this, this would probably work to our advantage. Yeah. That's an excellent point. Yeah. At some point, that we should just to consider among ours whether we want to maybe bring in at some point not some representatives and some of those manufacturers. If it's appropriate to talk to these folks, we can get into that question. Bring in a different, uh, well, I mean, Anthony's certainly not in manufacturing, you know, so we're all. Yeah. Hey, Chairman, to, to, to your point, um, Valerica was the, the town that you were talking about. Yeah, Valerica. Right. 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 But uh, so that doesn't. That doesn't preclude us from sending an information or getting or meeting with our um, superintendent of schools and saying, look, it, you're doing a great job here with the manufacturing law. Here's another town in Massachusetts, and maybe who can get a hold of this uh, superintendent of schools in that area? And maybe they're doing something you're not, or you're doing something they're not, about each other. Yeah, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's worthwhile because we can always make whatever we're doing better. Yeah, <laughs> and that's all I did. Okay, so my sense is for the website design, that is going to be something that needs fewer people than the rebranding. <clears throat> um, so, Callum, I, my sense is that you would like to probably work on the website stuff. Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. Thanks. Samantha, the same thing for you? Yep, and I also wanted to add, I forgot to mention, uh, Chandler Shea and I have a meeting with <clears throat> Will, um, oh, who... Cool. Yeah, so that's today at 3.15, so we'll have some more research to provide next time as well. Yeah, um, you should bring Calum in on that one, too. Okay, that's today at 3.15, if you're available. Uh, yeah. All right, cool. Um, Calum, just so you know, Will Hare is a QU alum. He was a uh, retired military, came here under the GI Bill, and super awesome guy. He was an entrepreneurship major, graduated, <laughs> ended up starting... I don't know how many different businesses. He and his wife actually did a social media consulting business that, and then I brought them back to co-teach the small business marketing class with me. And they talked specifically about SEO and whatnot. This was several years ago, but, and then they kind of got out of that and then they went back and now they're in North Carolina with a nine man shop doing specifically social media consulting. So, um, yeah, like kind of a good person to talk to. And probably someone that you can be bringing because he is happy to help mentor people with, I don't know, like existing businesses like yours. So. <laughs> Perfect. Talk with them. Uh, okay, so my sense is to, for Callum and Samantha, the question for you guys, would it be helpful to have a third person working on it or do you think two is sufficient to address all the different websites type things? How many subgroups total would there be? Like, we, I mean, you said that it seemed like there would be a lot more need for the rebranding. Yes, that is correct. Now, I think, I think um, that two is probably enough to do a full audit of the website. Um, and we can provide the report on the capabilities and everything else that um, is notable information regarding the website fairly easily, but you know, depending on what the next steps are, we provide that insight is when uh, it might be helpful to have the third person. So I'm hearing yes for a third person. Is that was that? Uh, I'm hearing. Well, uh, sorry, I'm saying. Uh, I just we. I think that we need to do an audit first to see what um, you know action. Yeah. Audit, and then maybe later on. Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. That works out great. So then Callan Smith, you guys will be the two spearheading the, the website redesign. And if for whatever reason you say that you need extra help, you can always tap on someone from the rest of the group. And then the other rebranding, because there's a bajillion pieces to that, that's gonna just gonna be everyone else. So we'll send out all the I am going to send this awesome. one thing out. I had it all typed out. I was trying to take notes of like, oh, this is much. <laughs> yeah, I kind of did the gish gallop of just like, <laughs> so um, this is what I'm going to propose. 
for the website redesign, you guys know that you need to do the audit, but also we need for next week a proposal for how to move things forward. The same for the rebranding. So I am going to recommend a couple of different things. The first thing is that, yes, you guys will need to do brainstorming, but as Brenda knows, because she's taking the creativity class right now, just doing a brain drain isn't going to get us the best possible solutions. So I'm going to toss out a couple of other ones and I'll put them in the email so that way you don't have to like take notes. Uh, and the idea is to generate a whole bunch of ideas where we can put those into either a Word doc or Excel spreadsheet. Probably Google Sheets. We'll just do it in Google Sheets because it'll be easy. We will generate a whole bunch of ideas over the first week. The second week, we'll be then narrowing it down to what are the top ideas. And doing it in Google Sheets gives us the ability that each person can then vote for ideas that they think should carry forward. We can then do a quick, easy sort based off of how many people have voted for any particular idea. And then that becomes our ones that we definitely want to move forward, ones that we can choose to move forward with, and so on and so forth. Make sense? Yeah. Do you guys have any questions or anything that you're like, hey? Brenda, you're, you're so to look into that. Uh, yeah, 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 I'm so to look into Brian and what they're doing. Yep. So we have that. We have Jack is going to also look a little bit more into what makes Windsor website so effective. Right. And he's going to reach out to you to get the contact for the economic development. And then there were no other specific person related things, but um, one of both of these things have been pulled into the other stuff already. Yeah. One other issue that was mentioned by uh, Andy and Kelly, who uh, is not on the call for the meeting today, one of our commissioners, is, is how do we start to zero in? How do we start to take and, and refine you know, the different types of businesses? So, right now, we're talking about you know, reaching out, driving, you know, use the website, all good, but there's, there's some target. <coughs> This is category, so we think it would be ideal for us. How do we how do we get in there? And the, the other thing that's critically important is the brokerage community. Uh, brokers are going to drive business to the town. And they know that they can make money doing it. That's the way the whole brokerage model is set up. So I think I think we need to take and, and not only reach out to specific businesses, but within the brokerage community, there's there's uh, companies that um, focus on the what they call site finders. <laughs> So, I mean, and it, site finders are not hard to find. You can Google site finders and get a. So, how do we, how do we continue to match the site finders saying, hey, yeah, we, we got this, we got this oasis in, 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 this oasis in Connecticut you need to consider. So, re refining messages as we're trying to formulate them. I, I think that's a, a very good point because every time I leave these meetings, I'm thinking about that. Are we going towards this end? And we as a group have to start developing a thought about what businesses we want to attract. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's what we'll zero in on in the future about what we want to attract. So if it's the medical community, OK, we're going to be the best spot for the medical community. Taking in fact that, what industry use a lot of power? Because we have very inexpensive power. So we have water, we have very expensive, inexpensive power, and we tax rate. So what industries? maybe use a lot of power and would come to us. Maybe that's the reason for them to come to us. Or maybe we should be into the medical end of it. Like Bradford seemed to have done. I mean, yeah. Bradford only has to be the only one who's in the medical. We're surrounding New Haven, who's a big medical area in the jail. And we're not that far away. Maybe that's what we zero in. But there's other industries we haven't even thought about yet. I think that's what we need this group to start thinking about, those industries. And I think that's going to come out as we look more closely at the four criteria that John and Callum called out. Because right now, because there's been such a heavy emphasis on the utility and the bill rates, and, but the other three, the infrastructure, the workforce, and the quality of life, Wallingford has those very strong too. And we need to find businesses where the mesh of the four really speaks out to them. Right. If you only have one thing, then we could be like, ah, energy on the way and go only for the heavy energy. But there are companies that I think, the ones that have uh, some sort of social responsibility to their employees, where they want to, yeah, we want to make profit, but we also care about our employees. So we had um, 
kind of like the Zappos of the world, where they have a strong employee development and quality of life, right. and see about pulling those businesses in too, because you're creating, hey, look at this beautiful state that your employees would enjoy living and working in. Oh, by the way, we can also make your business cheaper. Right. But is the quality of life the primary reason for them coming in? It depends on the business, because there are ones that are essentially low-profit LLCs, yeah. where they their emphasis is less on trying to make money and more trying to do either social good or make sure that their employees have a quality of life. So that would be an industry. That would, yep. So um, within that industry, one may be for shoes, and other ones may be for IT development. But it's an industry of people who want to take care of their employee first, and then have a business side. That's correct. Yeah. In matter of fact, in Connecticut, we officially have a uh, benefit corporation, which there are very many of them, and most of them are really small. But that mentality there, benefit corporations are for profits who have officially signed off on, hey, we're a for profit, but. Benefit. We're going to act like a nonprofit, okay. and a very unique mentality, but it is a growing mentality that we are seeing. I actually uh, did a research project where I was talking to people across multiple states who all formed that and why they had founded it, and it came down again and again. They were caring about either what they were delivering or the people that they were working with first. Or both. Yeah, or both. Interesting. Yeah. Okay, the one thing that was mentioned. In the prior meeting, and it was mentioned in one of the reports today again, is um, the ease in which, or the difficulty in the um, uh, approval process in the community. Right? Mm -hmm. And that, that's, a, that's a pretty important component. And I will say that that, that, that is not on Wallinger's terms. Right? So you can yeah. you, you, you get to the point where we attracted the business to the door, you get to the door, and then the approval process starts, and they said they're wondering so, why they can't. Tim, can I actually give you a task to give us a write up of what is the process that someone needs to go through? Yeah. Yes. And I, I want to say, Tim, I mean, I think one of the other things that come out of this, I mean, we have so many, but is how can, you know, how, how can we be easier? And I know you work with that all the time, and it's not an easy uh, objective, but certainly. Uh, yeah. What do other towns do, for example, Bill Ricca, or what other towns do? That can come out of this framework so that Tim can begin working with our government. This is what our objectives are from the EDC. We need your assistance. And this is our other towns that have jacked up the data. So they've, they've been successful. This is how they operate. How can we do that yeah. as well? Anyway, like that. So actually, Chandler, how about I break you off? You can work with Tim on this to specifically look at what are other towns doing for their process, and to come up with some recommendations for how we can streamline Wallingford's whole process, because all the work that you guys are doing, if it, it, it doesn't work if we can't actually get towns, businesses to be like, oh yeah, I can actually move relatively easily. Right. So. Do you guys think one of the problems is that since you're an older town, the council and the approval process tends to be more conservative than that they go? Um, I, I don't think it's as much that, I mean, we're, we're conservative towns, no choice about it. But I don't think that's the reason for it. I think it's it's been done this way for so long, yeah. and it's worked. Yeah. So why wouldn't, and, and the employees who are in that process, for the most part, have been there for a long time. So you know, I did it this way, we're doing it this way, we're going to do it this way. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean it's the right way, or new times have new, new ways of doing things, you know. But, yeah. But I don't think it's because it's so conservative that I, I want it in someone else's backyard. I don't want it in my backyard. I don't think it's that much for that. Now, my sense is that this is just institutional inertia. Yeah. When I was working in the government, there were a lot of things that were. Yeah. Well, we had come up with, uh, we found a way to get a solar panel company to install solar panels in, onto the roofs of buildings. Mm -hmm. And then we would just buy the energy off of them, but the company itself paid for the solar panels, they maintained it, they used everything. And it was going to save us $10,000 for one building per month. Wow. And we were like, this is great. Look at all this energy that we can, or all this money we can save. And it got shut down by our environmental office because we didn't start it with them first. And this was the process. <laughs> yeah, the one thing you'll see with government is they have absolutely 
absolutely no incentive for, for money, for savings, and correct. They just don't. And the mentality is, and there's no penalty for that, to be quite honest with you. So they can, they can stop a process, and unfortunately, a, bit, a private company will go out of business if they don't continue to promote and improve. Government doesn't go out of business, so I'll just raise our taxes. And, uh, so, to, so to their point, but I think in dealing with pri even private industry so many times when I'm troubleshooting and I hear that same problem or uh, that same situation in which this is the way we've always done it, many times it's because they don't know what they don't know. So it's, and you can't accept, you can't anticipate that they're going to figure that out on their own. So that's why we have to show them this is not how, how it, it best practices. And this, th and then we have to sell it. This is how it's going to benefit the town and then more importantly, this is how it's going to be benefit you as an individual because ultimately people make decisions. We all talk about making decisions for the benefit of the whole. Yeah, kind of, more, but it's ultimately what it benefits yourself and those that are close to you. And that's the message that we ultimately have to, have to address. And that's that's the, who, who we have to touch in that manner. So, Channel, you and I work on that? Yes. Just, just to put a ribbon on that. So, one of the things that I've I, um, driven at Town Hall is start every conversation, every opportunity with possibility thinking. All right? Possibility thinking. And then if you can always think, I want to have control of the situation or if it's something that we eventually don't want, we have the ability to say we don't want. But I at least want the ability to say that. So possibility thinking gets the opportunity to make, right? Government starts every conversation with what why don't we want to do it? I mean it just it, they're, they're so far on the other side of the spectrum it's always easier to say no right so the, the skepticism that has been bred in a lot of these you know departments in terms of the approval process is something that, that we need to continue to work with and overcome. So there are solutions out there, there are best practices out there that we need to identify. Um, there are automated solutions that can expedite the process that we don't have. And, you know, I, I suspect, not to draw conclusions, but I suspect that what we're going to find is that with a little, a little bit of automation in our process, we can save and shape months off of the approval process. If you have to go to as much as two commissions, that's four months. Mm -hmm. If you're trying to condition on your building and you have to wait four months just for the approvals, that's way too long, in most cases, way too long. So there's great opportunity there, and I think that's a very important component of, if you all work to get into the door, we got to make sure we get them through the... The, 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 way to do it is the, high, the way to do it is the high salary increases to the great list of improvements. <laughs> that will never happen, unfortunately. Okay, so let me just do one more quick recap. So, Helen and Samantha, you guys are going to do website design, and then you guys are going to share with Helen the Zoom information so that Helen can join on with Will. Spectacular. <laughs> Check that out. Uh, for the branding, this is going to be Brenda, Jack, John, and Shay. And then Chandler, depending on how much time it takes to get all that information, you may be just working with Tim for the whole time, or if you can get done early, then you can jump out together. Yep. I think Chandler's going to have some more to do. Yeah, so that's why I'm keeping you heads up. My guess is that, especially if you guys are going to try to say, how do we redesign this whole process? You're probably going to, that's what your two weeks are going to be focused on. Okay. Um, if, if there's, um, if any one team is overpopulated, you know. Uh, yeah, we can always get people to. I know he's got, he's got a full workload, too. Yeah, there's, so, yeah, there's a fair amount of work to be done on what I'm talking about. Totally fair. So, so let's, let's shoot for a date that we need to be That is the next thing. Yep. I'm looking for the 16th. So that would be two weeks from now. Mm -hmm. And we can do the same time if that works. Okay. Eight o'clock, thank you. Eight to nine thirty I'm putting in just to yeah. Yep. Especially because you guys will probably have a lot of things to report out on, so I don't want to charge you. The only other thing I would ask you, just just with great information. If we could get it before this meeting, like if I got last night, I could really have to make notes and yeah. stuff like that. So, if you have any other questions, I sent it out for a
Well, you sent it out? Yeah, we got it. Exactly. Right. I did the run back. So I'm not oh, right. Right. You're right here. I didn't. Oh, right here. Mm -hmm. All right. This is what it sent on Friday. I didn't get that at all. Okay, thank you. And I just sent this whole one out to access me. Okay. You know, before everybody breaks up, but if anybody's got a run, please do so. I'll do it. That's right. But I did talk to David briefly in the committee briefly about, you know, maybe loading you guys in a, in a van and taking a tour of lines. Anybody feel that that would be beneficial? I think it would be yeah. nice to see you. Yeah. I don't know what we're going to do. <laughs> yeah. I said, we're asking you to take a market a product and you know, haven't seen it. Yeah. You know, haven't seen the product, which may be very helpful and see you know, to do it. So, there we go. Callum, Samantha. We got some more? Yeah. I'm okay. Yeah. Well, anybody know why Shay is not here today? No. Yeah. Okay. I didn't hear so. Yeah, so we'll find out on that one. Hopefully, it's not something like she got sick. Yeah, yeah, right. And Dave, is it, is it, I don't know how it works at the university, but I see these shuttle buses going back and forth. Is it, can we come here on one of those for a, a morning and do it for uh, that is a fair question. So the shuttles that we have are, the ones that you see, are set on predetermined routes. Yeah. So I don't know, do we actually have shuttles that are for rent? I don't think so. Whatever yeah. check-in is done, you have to get a rent. Yeah, so but I think... That's also a whole bunch of us. Yeah, totally fair. But I'm trying to make things even with smaller number of students, like taking new students on entrepreneurship competitions, and either it's our own cars or rent a bus. Okay. So, yeah, I don't think that we have. Well, so, 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 so long as you don't mind the brand, the Masonic home, <laughs> it's got a shuttle bus. Plus, if you get a shuttle bus. Look the youngest people that are ever been on. <laughs> <laughs> if you get a bus, I don't know what the rules are distancing. You have to make sure we just Yeah, you have to get a bus for your bus. Yeah. Okay, we'll see if we can work up the logistics for that. Yeah. yeah. I know the shuttle buses here, the way they have distancing is, so it's the way the shuttle starts out because it's two rows of two seats on the side and how it is is it's every other seat. So like in the first row, someone could sit on the right hand seat in the row behind it's on the left hand seat. So it's basically just half the pass. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, I'll take one of the Cool. Because we'd be observing all the normal rules and regulations that people do anyways heading to and from campus. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.